Acts chapter 11, I don't know, verse 19, we'll start there. The gospel broke through, if you remember last Sunday, walls, divisions that were happening as the, the people are trying to be, uh, trying to come together and the Holy Spirit is, is breaking these cultural, cultural differences, prejudices, uh, really age-old age old hatred with, between people. And that's because the Holy Spirit, God is no respecter of persons. He's an impartial God, right? And he poured out the Holy Spirit now on the Gentiles. So Gentiles, and they have their own Gentile Pentecost service, making them just as, marking them, making them just as chosen and elect as the Jewish nation. That's radical. So they're glorifying God. In Acts chapter um, 11, 18, we're kind of where we left off. And to the Gentile also, God granted repentance that leads to life. So today we're going to move from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, now to, to Antioch, the portal, really a portal to the ends of the earth. And we'll start in verse 19. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also preaching to the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and he saw the grace of God, he was glad. And he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he had found Saul, when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Antioch, third largest city of the empire, around 500,000 people. Think about that. Just picture it. We have, what, 11,000 people in this town, or if you want to call it a city, I guess. And it, it's an open door to the spreading of the gospel everywhere. Remember, preach to all nations, starting in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the surrounding area, and then to the ends of the earth. This is where it starts. And those who were scattered at, at Stephen's persecution, the Hebrew-speaking ones that were close to Jerusalem, not really used to the Gentile culture, they stuck with ministering to the Jews. That's what they were really comfortable with. But others, the word says, who had grown up around the Gentile uh, culture, they're moving from Cyprus and Cyrene. They're, they're used to that. They grew up around these Gentiles. They, they kind of, they're acclimated to that. It would be like if you were born and raised in Spencer and I took you on a trip to New York City and told you just go minister, you'd be like, whoa, I need a tour guide. And the culture, it would be a shock to you. To me, it wouldn't because I was raised close to there. So it's kind of like that. You'd be more comfortable maybe with a small town vibe, right? So they're using their differences their specific differences for the kingdom instead of against it. Because remember how, how this church was starting to want, trying to be divided by the enemy. He external attack, internal attack, the Greek speaking, the, the Greek speaking Jews and the Hebrew, Hebraic, the, the Hebrew speaking Jews were arguing, you know, which widows are being taken care of, that kind of thing. They had issues because they did things a little bit differently. So instead of fighting about it, now they're using their differences to reach people. And that's, that's, this, is the, this is one of the keys. Our differences, even in here, should be breaking barriers, not building them. In Antioch, the keys to the kingdom open that last door 
breaking down all those barriers. So your, your background, you all have a background, we all have a history, some have different languages, ethnicities, your age, right? Gender, social status, how about education level? Life experience, all of that, everything that's happened to you up to this moment and who you are is a precious gift from God to reach someone with a little more sensitivity. And if you don't have that same culture or history as someone else, well, that, that's when you need to expose yourself to new things, like new cultures. I don't mean like new sinful things, right? You have to become acclimated. And that's what missionaries do. They go to language school right off the bat. They learn about the culture. And, and when they are acclimated, then they, sometimes they'll wait even a year, two years before even mentioning they're not walking in there, out there and saying, all right, hey, Jesus loves you, and I'm going to, here's the scripture. They have to get acclimated. But some of us, really, we need to go to school in our own, in our own area and get acclimated to the people around us anyway, like even our, our neighbors, instead of avoiding them. Because you're never going to reach anybody if, if you just constantly avoid them, because you're not comfortable. And that's why Paul says later in 1 Corinthians 9.22, to the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak, I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. He's not saying syncretism where I'm going to mix Christianity with uh, whatever, or I'm going to, he's not saying compromise of the gospel message. He's promoting, it's called a considerate evangel evangelistic approach. We're being considerate of others, and we're taking to, into account their differences, their ethnicities, right? Even their religious convictions. If you're, you're reaching somebody who has no experience with it. So how, but how did, how did they do this in the early church? Because this is some deep-seated stuff. Well, we saw that last Sunday, and the same way that Peter changed, being full of the Holy Spirit by the hand of God, because it's going to be supernatural, so in, here in Antioch now, this is exactly how it went. Uh, verse 21 says, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. So they didn't just believe, they turned to the Lord. You, you see that repentance there. So word is traveling now. Something big is going on in Antioch. They hear about it, the church in Jerusalem, and they send Barnabas. We know that he's an encourager, and it would be important to encourage people who are coming into this just called an international church because when people step into a new, a new gathering, what, I mean, what's, what's going through your mind? You know, what, what, when you church shopped or if you're church shopping, what do, what's, you know, do, do I feel... You know, did heaven open up and tell me I belong here? Or do you feel welcome? Are people encouraging you? That kind of thing. That, that's what they needed at that time. He wasn't, he wasn't there just like, okay, I'm going to make sure everything is, is going on right here. He was there to encourage people. And today, who, who is encouraging you? Who are you encouraging in this place? There's people who need encouragement. If, 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 we, if we believe somehow, which definitely was not the early church, that the only encouragement you get is here at this altar, on these squares, when I'm standing here talking to people, that, that's completely false. We're here to encourage one another and exhort one another. And there are people in here who need encouragement. It's easy to just walk away. It's easy to just do your time and get out. Let me do my spiritual thing and get out. This wasn't the case. They're living together. They're, they're walking together day to day. Remember, still no church buildings. Still no church buildings. Um, and when people come in, before you come to church, perhaps you were used to being rejected by the church, right? Maybe you expect it. Uh, they're, they're, I, I hear it all the time. They're not going to, you know, my hair is purple or pink or something. I, I don't know. I mean, that shouldn't, that, or I have tattoos, or um, I don't know, piercings, what? Or, or maybe your job, your, what you do for a living, what, what you're afraid of being rejected. And I hear crazy stories. I hear of churches, they will find out that someone who is coming, I don't know, maybe had a, had a divorce in the past or something like that. And they, no, I'm sorry, you're going to have to leave. You're not welcome here. Or 
or any other sin you could imagine in their past. My goodness. So, so Barnabas comes not to inspect them like that. It, the word says he saw the grace of God in Antioch. That's the, I mean, that, that's the grace of God. All these people coming together. The first Gentile church. And he says, remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. And he realizes this is a, this is a lot. So he goes and he finds Saul. And when he finds Saul, verse 26, he brought him to Antioch. And for the whole year, they met with the church and they taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. And that's really our key verse for today. Because there's a big change going from disciples to Christians. Disciples to Christians. The movement is being recognized as something else by, by outsiders. And, and that still continues today, and that would be the name that uh, obviously we take on ourselves. And that's because disciples, that word was too general. In the Greek, it just means learners or pupils. It's not a, it's not a distinct title. There's, there's lots of disciples. There's disciples of other people today. There's followers of, of, of other people today. There was uh, disciples of John, disciples of Moses. Other rabbis had disciples. It was common. And and up till now, really, the the Jewish Christians, they were just seen as another sect of Judaism. Like, they were seen as a crazy sect. Another word for that would be denomination. That's what they were, they were seen as a denomination of Judaism. But the thing is, the word denomination was not even in existence back then. Word history, if you study the etymology, um, it's from the 15th century. The word denomination that we use today. And it started out to to define classes of people during that time or classify things in general. And then in the 16th century, it was used as denomination of like playing cards, the value, the face value of things, right? Uh, Banknotes. Money. Then in 1716, this is when the word started being used for what we have today as called religious denominations. And today I'm talking about Christian denominations. And that's because there was uh, groups in England who were arguing and they wanted to distinct Christians, they wanted to distinguish themselves from the established Church of England but they had to remain loyal to the state. So the term was used to counter all those negative connotations when you hear the word sect, because that sounds like, oh man, it almost sounds like, I don't know, cult or something, or you know, something bad. The fact is the early church didn't want denominations. They didn't want classes or people or separations based on value or, or worth and all those things. And the the early church and and these apostles and the disciples, they worked hard to remain united in a hostile environment, in a hostile culture. It wasn't the Bible Belt, under the Bible Belt area, if you've ever been there, where, you know, you just have the freedom to basically feels like that anyway. Or even America, where we still have more freedom. I, I, I think uh, Kim was just praying that. We have more freedom to worship Christians than you think. Don't take it for granted. We're not, we're not being dragged off for our faith and tortured this morning. Our idea of persecution is more like seeing a, a blank spot in an application that asks for your preferred pronoun or uh, not, you know, not being able to say Merry Christmas at your job. That's, that's our ideas of persecution. When was the last time you were spit on or imprisoned just for being a Christian, for your allegiance to Christ? That was happening back then, and it still happens overseas. It's not happening here. And yeah, many of you are thinking, yet, yeah, Pastor. Well, yeah, sure. Luke 21, 11. What Jesus had said would happen to his followers already started. That there will be great 
earthquakes and in various places famines and pestilences and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven but before all this they will lay their hands on you and persecute you delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake this will be there it is your opportunity to bear witness and and there's so much there. We have natural disaster. We have persecution. All these things, there are opportunities for us to witness to Christ. There are many believers wrapped up in end times events right now. Even to the point of predicting specifically when Jesus is coming back. Some are waiting for those things to happen. To, to know, because when this happens, when there's all these things, then, then I'm going to get serious about my allegiance with, to Jesus Christ. Then I'm going to get serious about witnessing. I'll be ready by then. I'll be stocked up enough, and I'll have learned the word enough, and here's a reality check for you. And here, here's a warning, church. If something is, someone is telling you that Jesus is coming on such and such day, just consider it uh, heresy. Just, just ignore it. Don't get wrapped up in it. It's a pull, I know. It's exciting, I get it. I, at, at one time I, I was, but there's a point where you have to stop thinking like a child. And that's, um, that's the reality. And you have to move on to maturity. And maturity really is just going to be ready all the time. So, plus you're not going to figure it out. End times, the last days, what we talk about the last days, it started back then. We're, and right now we're in what, AD 40, uh, 5, 6, 7, around that time period. End times began back then. Acts eleven twenty eight, 28. And one of them, Ag Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit, hey, there's still, there's still prophecy going on. Okay, the gifts are still continuing. Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine all over the world. Now in 44 to 47 AD, there were floods in Egypt and uh, Mongolia. This is history. Acts is historical. And caused great famines as predicted. And these were opportunities for the church. And they continued. And I have some of them listed. I mean, look at the, the disasters that continued. Uh, famine in the Roman Empire. Let's see. Pompeii. Vesuvius. Keep going. Second century. Antioch earthquake. Wow. They just continue. And if you look, I looked at... I'm like, man, this is just like, yeah, it is, it's just increasing, but it started back then. And in the midst of that, in a similar, it's weird, it's in a similar situation we are right now. I mean, this morning, we're here in Spencer, we were just affected by a natural disaster. We're recovering. We're not fully recovered yet. I'm reminded of that driving down 18th every day. And I still remember the garbage piles. And I, I see the trailers. And I, I'm Right in our own country, there are other people who are, like, ransacked. I mean, I heard about a, a, a mom who lost a seven-year-old, just swept away. It's, yeah, that's, that's hard. What are we going to do about that? We just, well, we'll just, we'll just sit here and we'll just, well. The church was like, no, we're going to do something. And they're being... <laughs> they're being persecuted, mind you. And they're, they have all these crazy differences, multi-ethnic, uh, radical, it's a radical movement. So what were they known for in the midst of this? What was the church known for? Well, they were known for generosity. They were known for generosity. They were giving to those in need. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Sending relief to that church just to help the church um, build more buildings? No, because there wasn't any buildings then. 
It was so that they could be benevolent to those in their location. And then, of course, helping those who are or, or in need within the congregation. And you see the word elder. So you see this kind of a, a structure. I wouldn't exactly call it that. You see that apostle gift where versus, versus the, the modern-day apostle idea of uh, I'm apostle, you know, whatever, and I'm, you know, this is my title. The apostles were more like a church planner, they're, or they're more like encouraging and sending out and doing those kinds of things. So that's still, today we have people in that role. Just want to clarify that. But when they were planting other churches, they weren't planting new denominations at this time. This is all before brands, brandings, and logos, and, and buildings, and Basilicas. This is before bylaws. They were dedicated to encouraging one another, being generous, and they spent a lot of time being taught the Word of God and teaching the Word of God. So they would be known for their teaching. They most definitely spent less time worrying about lighting and music and stage setup. The Bible says for the whole year they met with the church just and, and taught a great many people. That's why he needed help. He had to go find Saul. Saul's hard to find. He's a popular guy. He's, he's probably pretty well known because of what transformation he had in his life. So we're here in Antioch. We're in the last days already, 2,000 whatever years ago. This is what areas, no, this is what was ancient Syria, Antioch, and today it would, be, it would be Turkey, but it's only 10 hours, I don't think it's ironic, it's 10 hours from Nineveh, where Jonah refused to teach, and they're listening and they're learning, so these learning disciples are going to be first called Christians here of all places. Before we get to Christian, I want to go to called, because called is an important word. Originally, it meant to do business. And I think of DBA, like to do business as. You ever have a two, you ever do that? Anybody in business? You have a DBA, you set one up, and then you, you want to finally get it legally changed. To have a business affair or dealings, to manage a business, and later that word morph, that word for called, it had what's called a semantic shift because definitions of words can change over time. This word, this definition changed over time. And what it means here is accepting the title of an office or a name one inscribes in official records, whether a family name or a national citizenship. Called, called. In other words, it's a, a legal context so disciples are legally inscripted with this title, Christians. And now we get into the word Christians. It was a title of mockery from the outside to start out with. Because they're like, oh, you know, you know you're, you're associated with, with, with Christ. But the word Christianos is a Hebrew word with a Latin ending transliterated into Greek. That's, a hard, that's hard stuff to do. The Latin ending was used for groups devoted to, so you have your, um, you, like, Anne, or, or, or I think a political stuff. So a political leader. It's, it's people devoted to, so they're thinking of like a partisan to Christ, that kind of allegiance. And that's how they, they called them, and that's how they saw them. Like, you know, most people, they're on, like, a certain political party, and there's another certain political party, and they're always fighting all the time. And then they say, oh, yeah, them, whatevers, and that's kind of what they're doing. So it, you can relate it to that. Now, they called them that because they're associated not with a president or a king, but because they're associated with Jesus Christ. So to believers, this is an honor. Like, okay, that's not a mocking to me. Um, and that's the name now. It's Christians, Christians, Christianos. Um, in fact, after the book of Acts, and this is going to blow your mind, and you're probably going to check. 
After the book of Acts, the word disciple is not used again for the rest of the New Testament. That's it. You won't find it there. Now, of course, we still make disciples, right? We, we have learners and followers. There's a process. But those learners will be identified by the world, by outsiders. You'll be identified as this Christianos, Christian, Christ, follower, or of Christ. So in the, in the other 22 books... Uh, Romans through Revelation. You know those are letters written by Christians to Christians for teaching. For, for, for uh, the followers of Christ are addressed as saints, uh, chosen, elect, faithful, a priesthood, brothers and sisters, children of God, heirs, servants of Christ. Basically just people who have changed allegiances and are forever identified with Christ, our Messiah or King. And that association now with that name brings great joy and the reality of suffering with, with the risk of, yeah, dying, going to jail, legal charges. And that's how the, the next time Christian is used or, or the last time Christian is used um, 1 Peter 4.16 If anyone suffers as a Christian let him not be ashamed but let him glorify in that name. So Peter if you get charged as a Christian <laughs> if they take you because you're a Christian because you're associated with Christ uh, glorify God in that name because that's the name that that's, that is there's something about that name all those great songs that we sing about the name, and, and, and you hear in the name, and, and all of this. Remember, it's not a magic formula. Like, you just write this everywhere, and your day's going to be really awesome. Um, it's the identity. It's the nature, because we're talking about God, because Jesus is God. So the name that God gave to identify his chosen people Isaiah 62, 2 says, The nation shall see your righteousness and the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. So we're called, but disciples are called Christians now, and my question would be, why would believers in, in the church want to be called anything else but Christian to the world around us? What does it say about unity for us and, and, and adherence to that name when we have now 45,000 denominations of Christianity? 45,000. What happened? Well, this is what happened. This is how it all went down. Just a summary. Christians were united under that name for about 150 years. This is all it took. There was a, that's just, that's not all 45,000, that's just the major ones. It, Christianity was just called normal. Orthodox just means normal. Just, you know, just the standard, okay? That's where the, we get that term. Now, Bar Barnabas and the other leaders, they said, remain steadfast. Look to Jesus. Don't be influenced uh, uh, around, with his culture around you. And pulled away from the, the, the teachings that we are teaching. But over time, it happens, doctrinal disputes started brewing. And the, the first thing where this all started, they, they argued about the nature of Christ. The nature of Jesus. They're thinking really deep, which we're designed to do. That's great. It's not great when it, when it does what, what it's, it's done in some ways. So one, one guy started teaching that Jesus was, okay, well, Jesus is, okay, God and man, but, well, um, you know, he must have been created at some point before time. So he started teaching that. Even though Jesus, very important to know that Jesus was never created. He's always existed. Always. He's God. It's a triune God. 
So basically, trying to, that would take away from a lot. Um, and take away from the divinity of Jesus, who is fully God and fully man. So they held a council, Council of Nicaea. And they created creeds to protect that theology. But they still found something else to argue about. So what did they do? They, they organized, they got together. Okay, we got to get, we got to protect this. And the Orthodox Church and the Roman Church, Roman Catholic Church split. And then the Protestant, Protestants split from that. And then the, the Protestants, I guess they got bored and needed to have something to fight about. So in the 17th century, Baptists were um, invented wanting to stress baptism because they thought that was most important. And then Methodism, Methodism came because they wanted to uh, stress holiness. And then pietism and revivalism came. This is now in the 19th century. Focusing on experiences. Do you feel... Do you feel his presence today? Do you feel that brush on your arm? That kind of stuff. Then Pentecostalism came pretty late in the game, and they focused on tongues and healing. That was was the focus. Then there was a holiness movement, and then you had Nazarenes and Wesleyans, and it goes on, and it's leading to where we sit today, and there are divisions born from one disagreement after the other because somebody thought their form of Christianity was stressing the best thing. Now, some of them are for sure heretical. It's, it's because, because they left the basic teaching of the Bible. They left key things that are... You, you, you take away Jesus being God, just, just leave. Interestingly enough, it's been in the 20th century and on that these non-denominational churches have increased, and that's a concept that even this morning when I say that, it's scary for people. Oh, non-denominational? Well, after all, we need structure, don't we? I mean, we need organization. We need accountability, Right? To, to what we're teaching and uh, we need a system and we need a government in the church to make sure everything is kept right and it's worked out and we're going to have requirements for everything. And here we are with a new name that God gave us to a new people and we formed uh, classes of people placing value on them based on doctrines that divided the United Church of Christians once teaching the same things the apostles taught. Catholic, the word, uh, Catholicos. That, that wasn't, this, that was in 107 AD, uh, it, it was Ignatius, it was, it, was, it was made to protect the idea that it was one church. And then, it, you know, things went, Bad, right? Splits happen. It, it wasn't supposed to be like this. The, the church is a worldwide group of people marked by love, generosity, teaching, uh, suffering, but most of all, Jesus Christ. It's, a, it's an undenominated church. And that's because Jesus Christ is going to return to be with a united bride. To rule an undivided kingdom. We know what he said about kingdoms. He taught us about it. This is how it looks in Revelation 19.7. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. It was granted for her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. The, the, the titles used in the, mainly for the, um, the Christians in the books of the Bible. So the fights Paul tried to stop early on, the Apostle Paul, they still continue today. And they've, they've brought about a denominated Christianity that honestly, I can't on my time... 18 years ago when I came in to uh, this awesome community of believers that we call Christians, I was scratching my head and confused why there were so many different names 
for people worshiping and called to the one God that you claim to serve. That's what I was thinking. So, so Paul, he writes to the Corinthian church, another divided church. 1 Corinthians 1.11, for it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. <laughs> what I mean is that one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was, was Paul crucified for you? Or were, were you baptized into the name of Paul? No, they were baptized into the name of Jesus. It sounds simple. This, is, this sounds like Sunday school stuff. And it should be. Why, why can't we just be called Christians? Why can't we just call ourselves Christians? The, the, the Christian church around the world identified and associated with Christ. And maybe you say this morning this. Well, I am, Nicholas. What are you talking about? I'm, I'm a Christian. And I'll say, I'll lead you to maybe the place that I was led to when I thought that. Because I've probably recently had these conversations and I, 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 I'm repenting on stage. You walk into a church or you, you meet somebody new. Say you're here today, you meet somebody new. Hey, uh, I'm Nicholas, nice to meet you. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, uh, thanks for making us feel welcome. Yeah, um, so where are, you, where are you from? And the conversation usually goes, or, well, I, I, I come from this church, or I was raised in this kind of church, and, you know. I, you know, I was raised in the, in the Lutheran church or the Catholic church, or the, and you kind of know where I'm going. And, and sometimes in our ignorance, or our fleshliness, I'll call it, we say, well, I'm glad you're in the right place now, where, where they preach the truth and the Holy Spirit is free to move, right? Oh, you were in that? You were in that denomination? I'm sorry. Yeah, I've heard that they, and I'm, I can, I'm guilty right here. The early followers of Christ, ladies and gentlemen, they were identified as Christians because they belonged to Jesus and it was obvious to the people around them. Their, their identities were marked by radical love because we, we say, oh, well, we, you know, we can't love everybody. Well, are you sure? <laughs> we're, are you, we can't? I think we can. Well, I don't have to approve of their sin. I didn't say that. Just be considerate and, and treat them as uh, people made in the image of God and meet them where they're at and, and build a relationship. Generosity, giving, teaching, suffering. They saw how they cared for the sick and the poor, how they took care of widows and got over their petty uh, culture differences even within the church. They responded to natural disasters, people's needs, relating to instead of secluding from cultures around them and very simply gathering, the, the, the focus on, on the gathering was teaching. We, we did make concerts at some point. I mean, yes, there's worship and of course all that, but, but the, the, the preparation, and in today's day and age with so much to deal with as far as truth and, and doctrine, teaching is very important. Doctrine is very important. They gathered to hear teaching based on the word of God, not a man's last name. Teaching based on the word of God, not a man's last name or a woman's last name. There was no time for them. There was no time for them, church, to get obsessed over the next, um, I'll say an election or political scandal because to them, they didn't serve the kings of the world anyway. It would not affect them like that. If anything, they're gonna pray and they're gonna reach. And in fact, if you look after the verses from today, a, uh, a, a, a political leader killing one of the apostles, James gets killed just for sport. Well, for power, really. It was that he wanted to have acceptance from, he, he needed more power. And the killing hasn't stopped since. The killing of Christians, we just don't see it here. People marked as Christians will be persecuted. 
And here, basically, it's, it comes down to allegiance, and that does go into baptism, and everything we're, we're talking about. Because you are, in the end, you're, not, you're gonna be marked as a Christian of belonging to Christ, or you will be marked by a beast. Meaning your allegiance. If you think it's a microchip or a vaccine, I'll talk to you for three hours after service and apologize to my family for the time I spent because that's not in the Bible. It's not a reality. It's something that someone taught that's not true. It's all about your allegiance. Who you serve today. Who people see that you belong to. Your persecutors, they could care less if you're Pentecostal or Lutheran or Baptist or Assemblies of God, or Reformed. To them, you're either allied with Christ or you're not. Because we've been called not by man, but by God to represent Christ our King. You haven't been called to represent Foundation Church or me, or my wife, or anyone else here, or Crosswinds, or Hope, or First Baptist, or Living Word, or whatever other churches we have in this town. You're not called to represent them. He he called us by a new name. And and it started, it's already started in the Bible. It's right here. And to me, wouldn't this be interesting? Wouldn't it be interesting we get to the last of things, right? And I, I, I just, I, I, I think of this verse. It's Revelation 2.17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Now imagine, just, just imagine if, imagine if this was not a symbolic verse. This is symbology. Imagine if you get that white stone, right? And you, you're thinking about, hey, what's, what, what's the new name that God's going to give me? Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's, I don't know, Francisco. I like my name, so. But man, I, you know, the name that God would give me would be so much better. And, you know, now I'm going to see, you're, you're, you're going to see what God really thinks about you and your life and, and what you've done and, and all he wants you to be, and you flip it over in the last of things, and it says this, Christian, imagine that, just of Christ, belonging to Christ, allegiance to Christ, that's radical, right? What if what he calls you in the end is what you were in him all along and what others saw in you? Well, the context of Revelation actually is more, most likely, the, the, the hidden name of God and the Lamb, which they will bear forever. And that's a word that's beyond our language and comprehension. But right now, as us, as finite humans, we know that name already, and that name is Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but I want to be affiliated with him. I want to be of Christ. When people see, I don't want them to see me. Yeah, it's cool, you know, hearing like getting promotions at your job and I'm sure fame is is cool for a time, but it feels good. But I want to make him famous. I want to be known for Foundation Church or Assemblies of God or... Whatever. You know, for Jesus Christ. Even during the flood, and uh, the flood relief stuff that, that we've done, not, not, not me and not my wife, but the church and the community together, which that's kind of like an Antioch thing right there. Like, oh, your church. I'm like, uh, Jesus did this. <laughs> he, he got the people together. Jesus got you here today want to be known for Jesus Christ. So this morning, what about you? What about us? Is this why we're here? Why are we here? Are we here to represent Christ? Are we here to belong to Christ? Does Christ mark your lives? And that's where repentance has to come in. 
Because we, we mature and we grow and we get to the point where we're thinking, is the way I just treated my wife upstairs in my room, is, is, how, I, is how I just talked to my wife, is that representing Christ? If this was a glass house, is what I'm doing, is what I'm thinking, is what I'm saying, is, is, is my allegiance to Jesus. Jesus doesn't have allegiance with our secret sins that we continue on after we've claimed that we've repented. There has to be a change. There has to be a transformation. There has to be a mat maturity. He doesn't have allegiance to your bitterness in your heart. And I'm hammering on divisions just happen to be an ax, but ladies and gentlemen, we may not have all the dynamic, cultural, ethnic divisions of a big city church, but we sure got some other divisions that need to be taken care of. Because it's affecting who others see you marked by in your Jerusalem, where you are. Do they call you Christian? Think about what that means. Is that what Jesus calls you? Is that what God calls you? Is that what the Holy Spirit has or is calling you into? Would you just bow your heads today and close your eyes? God gave us this name through a great, a great cosmic event that we can only scratch the surface of understanding. God's only begotten Son who has existed from all of eternity, never was created, entered into humanity, entered into human flesh, both fully God, both fully man, going through great hardships, exposed to the uh, suffering things that we go through, living among us, teaching us how to see each other as he sees us people made in his image, in the image of God, breaking down walls, preparing, planning, getting followers, and only in a very short amount of time, he was betrayed by one of those followers, and he was led to a cross where he was tortured and he was persecuted by religious and political authorities, and he didn't fight back. He went to that cross and he suffered, and he bled excruciating pain. He died for you. He rose again after three days. He told his followers, I'll be back. Let me give you some last instructions because I'm, 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 I'm sending my Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, for you to continue the mission. People are not going to have me around in the flesh to visibly see anymore in one location. So the Holy Spirit's going to do something radical and be poured out on people to reach this entire world. And they will be a people that are marked by my name, the name of Jesus Christ, not a denomination, not anything else. And when people see a person who has that kind of dedication and allegiance, it's recognizable. So what is your life marked by? Is your allegiance to Jesus Christ? Stop looking for signs. Stop worrying about it. If he takes care of the lilies, he's going to take care of you no matter what. When there's wars and persecutions and more natural disasters, all that matters is that you are marked by the name of Jesus Christ and that you are a Christian. This morning, if you are not allied to him, if you're not all in, full allegiance, and you want to be, your desire to be, you're here, and, and you have this voice that's saying, oh, well, you can't yet, because you gotta wait. You have to wait until you, you gotta clean up some things first. Let me tell you, none of these people in the early church had requirements for membership. When they came in, they just sat under teaching and the Holy Spirit helped them live this lifestyle that is, has the honor of being marked as a Christ follower. This morning, if, if you, you say, yeah, I, I, I want to be a Christ follower, this, no raised hands, I'm going to do it this way.
in your heart, in your mind, in that voice that you have, that precious dialogue that you have in your head. You say, Lord, I give my, I give my allegiance to you this morning. Just do it in, in silence. Thank you, Father.